we're going to take a look at trigonometric functions, and we're going to continue on with right triangles, co-functions, um, trigonometric functions of special angles, reference angles, and a couple other topics that are going to be important in this section. First, we want to review our right triangle-based definitions. We talked about sine in the coordinate plane in the last lesson, with it being defined as y over r, x over r, and x, y over x. And we talked a little bit about SOHCAHTOA. So we have SOH, which is sine opposite over hypotenuse, cosine adjacent hypotenuse, tangent opposite adjacent. So that's where SOHCAHTOA comes from. We remember that these identities are going to be the reciprocals of those. And we talked about if I'm in the coordinate plane, the convenient part is that I'm located here at the um, origin so that my opposite would be y, which is y, sine a is y over r. But in this one, we're going to put this into a little bit different of a context dealing with a right triangle. Now, I want to find the sine, cosine, and tangent values for angles a and b. So an angle is like our compass. An angle tells us where we are located in the triangle. So the very first thing you should do with any trig problem is figure out where am I. So if I want to do angle A first, you're going to put your finger on the screen on angle A. If you're touching angle A, you want to ask yourself, what leg is opposite of angle A? Well, for this one, that would be 7. Then you're going to ask yourself, what is the hypotenuse of the triangle? The hypotenuse is always across from the right angle. So my hypotenuse is 25 and my adjacent is 24. So that's if I'm located at A. If I'm located at B, this changes. My opposite is 24. My hypotenuse remains 25, but now my adjacent or leg that's touching my angle is seven. So using that theology, if I'm at 8, my opposite over my hypotenuse is 7 over 25. My adjacent over my hypotenuse is 24 over 25. And then my opposite over my adjacent is 7 over 24. And these are the answers. They're left as a fraction in a fraction format. If I want to find B, I'm located at B, so opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, and then opposite over adjacent. So the main mistake that happens here is you don't orient yourself properly using that angle to determine where you're at. Now our co-function identities are handy in the sense that if I have the sine of 30 degrees, that would be equal to the value of cosine of um, 60. So, if I'm doing 30 degrees, I would do 90 minus 30, which is 60. So, these two functions are equal at 30 degrees and 60 degrees. Same thing, tangent of 30 is equal to cotangent of 60. Cosine of 30 is equal to sine of 60. So, we have this relationship of being able to set them equal, which comes in handy most of the time with identity problems. We're not going to use this a ton as we move on, but we want to make sure we're noticing it in the pattern for our special value angles. So if I want to practice this, cosine of 52, I'm going to go back to my chart, cosine is related to sine. So the cosine of 52 would be the sine of 90 minus 52, which is 38. Tangent is related to cotangent from that chart. So I'm going to do cotangent of 90 minus 71, and I'm going to get 19. Secant is related to cosecant, so I would get 66. So these are helpful in some ways because we don't really use um, tangent and cotangent a whole lot. But you might know cotangent of 19 from the question, but not know tangent of 71. And we can use these co-function identities to swap out the actual trig function. Now, if I have an equilateral triangle, I can't use trigonometry with that because trigonometry requires that I have a 90 degree angle. So if I don't have a 90 degree angle, I'm not able to work with it. So when I bisect this equilateral triangle here, it forms a 30, 60, 90 triangle. And then I can actually do some trigonometry with it. I can separate them. 
And in a 30, 60, 90 triangle, my hypotenuse is going to be twice the value of my leg. So if I'm working with this, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to solve for x, or I could use the 30, 60, 90 special angle um, formulas. But I'm going to go ahead and use this, and I'm going to do 2 squared equals 1 squared plus x squared for my Pythagorean theorem, so that I get x is the square root of 3. Now I can find all of my trig functions because I've supplied this. Now, if I want it for this 60 degree angle, that's my compass. I'm here. If I'm here, opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse. So then I get those for my trig ratios. Got to orient yourself with that, with that. Now I can find my other three by simply flipping them. So cotangent is the flip of tangent, secant is the flip of cosine, and cosecant is the flip of sine. Again, I have a 45, 45, 90 triangle. Even though I'm only given two pieces of information, I can solve for R using the Pythagorean theorem. And then once I know the value of my R, I can find my trig functions. If I want to find the sine of 45, I can be located at either angle. It doesn't matter. So if I'm here, opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse. Now, notice that we're rationalizing the denominator. Your answer in the lab is not going to be considered accurate unless you have rationalized the denominator. So make sure you're multiplying 1 over the square root of 2 by square root of 2 over square root of 2, and you're entering it this way, not this way. Then I'm going to simply flip my other three functions, and I'll get the other three remaining trig functions. Now, these are some special angles, and I suggest that for the duration of this course, you copy this chart down, and you keep it handy by your computer, because these are angles we're going to expect you to know the exact value. If you tell me this decimal, it's wrong. If you put this decimal in the lab, it's wrong. It has to be these specific angles have to be entered with their exact values. So copy this down, pause the video, and make sure you keep this next to your computer for the entire trigonometry course. So reference angles are related to the chart you just copied. And a reference angle, remember how in the last lesson we talked about coterminal angles and we could keep spinning around by, third, by 360 degrees and we would wind up in the same spot. Reference angles mean that we can get it down to something between 0 and 90. That's our goal. We want to get the reference angle down into something between 0 and 90 so I can use this chart to find your exact value. So a reference angle is going to be a positive acute angle, meaning quadrant one, and it should be formed from the x-axis and the terminal side of the angle. So even though this is in quadrant two, I'm going to want to bring it over to quadrant one with some math, with an expression. Same thing here, same thing here. It's common to find the reference angle by using the terminal side of theta and the y-axis. I don't want to use the y-axis. So I'm not finding the angle between here and here. I'm finding the angle between the blue lines. So if I want to find the reference angle for 218 degrees, so this is 218 degrees, I don't want 218 degrees. I want it to be in quadrant one. When we're doing reference angles, we can subtract increments of 360 or 180 degrees to make that happen. So since 360 would not work here, because if I did 218 minus 360, that's going to be something outside of 0 to 90, I'm going to subtract 180. So I get 38 as my reference angle. If I wanted the reference angle for 1387, well, I'm going to have to get it down to a number between 0 and 360 first. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract 360 three times, and I get 307. If I subtract 180 from 307, that's not going to fix my problem. It's not going to be between 0 and 90. But what if I subtract 360? If I do 360 minus 307, it's 53 degrees. Now, you could also do 307 minus 360, but just remember the reference angle, we drop the negative. So we could still get 53 degrees no matter which order you do the subtraction, and it's right either way, but a reference angle can't be negative. And there's what that looks like on the actual coordinate plane. So here is a quick reference chart. Again, I suggest you pause the video and copy this down. If an angle is located in quadrant 2, so between 90 and 180, 
you're going to do 180 minus an angle to get the reference angle. If it's between 180 and 270, you're going to take the angle and subtract 180 from it. If it's between um, 270 and 360, you're going to do 360 minus the angle. So this is a great quick reference chart for you to use to know which way you want to be able to do your subtraction. So if I want to find the values of the six trigonometric functions for 210 degrees, the first thing I have to do is find that reference angle. So 210 degrees is located in quadrant 3, which based on the chart that I just saw, it says to subtract 180 from it. So that's 30. Now I'm going to go into my special chart that I just copied down for 30 degrees, and I'm going to look at my sine, my cosine, and my tangent. It's important to remember that it is in quadrant 3. This means from our previous lesson that the sine value is negative, the cosine value is negative, but the tangent value is positive. So I know from my chart that the sine of 30, that chart we just copied down, we're not doing the textbook method, the sine of 30 is 1 half. Because it's in quadrant 3, it's negative. I know the cosine of 30 is square root of 3 over 2 because it's in quadrant 3, it's negative. Tangent, same thing, it's square root of 3 over 3 from my chart, it's positive, and then I'm going to flip them to get my other six trig functions. So the method that the lab and the textbook are using with having to draw this triangle is not necessary if you've copied down that chart from earlier on where I told you to pause and it had the 30, 60, um, 30, 45, and 60 degree angle measurements. So if I'm looking at something and if the angle is greater than 360, this whole slide says you want to keep subtracting 360 until we get a value between 0 and 360 before we find a reference angle. So if I had 420 degrees, I would need to subtract 360 before I could use that reference angle visual I gave you. That's all this slide means. Once you find the reference angle, then you're going to use the chart from the previous lessons to know if the trig functions are positive or negative. So if I have the cosine of negative 240, first of all, negative 240 is actually in quadrant 2. So in quadrant 2, I'm going to go ahead and do 180. Um, I'm going to add 360 to get it positive first. So that's 120 degrees because it's not between 0 and 360. It's between it's negative 240. That gives me 120. Following the slide I just showed you, if you're in quadrant 2, you do 180 minus your angle, which is 60. So instead of following the method here, I'm going to go back to my chart, and I'm going to look at sine, cosine, and tangent of 60 degrees. Cosine would be 1 half. My chart tells me that cosine is negative in quadrant 2, so my answer is negative 1 half. If I want to find the exact value of tangent 675, exact value means that you're dealing with a number in the chart. It's greater than 360, so I have to subtract 360 first, and I get 315. 315 is in quadrant 4, which tells me I need to do 360 minus 315 is 45. So I'm looking at my chart at 45 degrees for tangent. The tangent of 45 is going to be 1. I know that the tangent in quadrant 4 is negative, so it's negative 1. So the sine is determined by what quadrant you're in. The value is determined by using the chart. I want to find, I want to be able to find all the values for which cosine is negative square root of 2 over 2. I'm going to go in my chart, and I'm going to look at where does cosine equal square root of 2 over 2. Well, it equals that at 45 degrees. I want to know where is it negative then. So then I'm going to look at my coordinate plane from our previous lessons, and cosine is negative in quadrant 2 and quadrant 3. So if I have 45 degrees, I'm located in quadrant 1. If I add 180, that puts me in quadrant 3. If I do 180 minus 45, that puts me in quadrant 2. So that's how I'm finding these angles. I have to first figure out where do I want to be, and I have to get there. Um, this is going to be using your calculator. So your calculator should allow you to enter 49 degrees in 12 minutes. In the Web 2.0 calculator, what I would actually do um, is I would enter 49 plus 12 divided by 60 in the parentheses. Because the Web 2.0 doesn't really do degrees, minutes, and seconds very friendly. Um, but you can try using that hash in there.
Calculators do not have a secant key, so we're going to have to do the cosine. Web 2.0 does have a secant key, so we're not going to be following this method because the calculator I give you to use does have secant. These are simple plug and chug. You're going to go into the calculator for Web 2.0. You're going to type in 1 divided by and just type in quotation of this. You're going to get the final answer. I'm not expecting you to use this identity. That's it. I'm going to type negative, sine of negative 246 into Web 2.0, and you should get this value. Please make sure when you're doing Web 2.0 that you are checking that you're in the degree mode. Now if I want to find the angle, this is where we have a special calculator. So in the Web 2.0 calculator, I showed you how to hit the second button. And when you hit the second button, it becomes sine with a negative 1 at the top. That means we need to use this. So in our calculator, we would type sine negative 1 of all of these values, and it tells us the value of the angle. There's no math needed here. This is completely done in the calculator. So anytime you're looking for the angle and it's not a value from our special angle chart, you're gonna do that. So you're gonna hit second on the upper left, then you're gonna hit secant, and you're gonna type in this value and it should give you this out because we don't have to worry about that identity because the calculator I gave you is slightly better. To find the secant of an angle, you can use the Web 2.0 calculator exactly. Now, why is, why is trig helpful? Trig is helpful because we deal with triangles all the time without even realizing it. If you've ever walked up a ramp, you've done trig. So when I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this car as it's moving up the incline. If you've been in a car, you live maybe in a hilly area, you've got to really push that accelerator down to get the car to go up the incline. And what we have to do when we're building these roads is ensure that we're not making that incline too steep because if that incline becomes too steep, then the car is going to struggle to go over it and we're going to have some issues with traffic, with potential accidents, and a lot of other dangerous things. So we use this expression, W sine theta, to describe the force the car is putting out, where this is my triangle, this is my theta, and the force is what the car is exerting. If I wanted to find the force for a 10 pound to the nearest 10 pounds for a 2,500 pound car going uphill at 2.5 degrees, I would type in my weight sine theta is what force is. This is a formula you're plugging into. So I take the weight of my car, I take the sine of my angle, and then my force the car has to exert to be able to get an uphill grade would be 110 pounds. So that's, that's pretty heavy, right? That's, that's not an easy task to do. If I'm going down, I'm gonna be doing 5,000 pounds, this time with a truck, and I'm gonna be doing sine of negative 6.1 because I have a downhill grade of negative 6.1. I type that in my calculator, I'm rounding to the nearest 10 pounds, and that's negative 530. And then it should make sense that it's negative because the truck is moving downhill, so the force is acting in a different manner. If I'm looking for the force at zero and 90 degrees, I have to remember the sine of zero is going to be zero, and the sine of 90 is going to be one. So if you're dealing with these grades, my force to be sitting flat on a horizontal is going to be just zero. If I'm sitting at 90 degrees, going straight up, it's going to be the weight of my car. And this is the explanation for why. And that is the end of 5.3, which is probably a section you're going to need to go through and watch this video more than one time. And that's okay. But make sure you pause the video each time I've indicated for you to pause it and you've gone over and copied down when I've asked you to copy.